Hello everyone, so this is the GCSE Combined Science Trilogy AQA Chemistry Paper 1 Foundation that was sat by pupils in May 2019. I'm going to go through and model how I would have tackled it. Um, I've put a link to the blank question paper and mark scheme in the description, along with question by question revision videos if you need to go back and revise the content for it. So, starting off with question number one then. This question is about energy changes. Which of these items uses an endothermic reaction? So an endothermic reaction is one that absorbs energy and therefore makes the environment around it colder. So therefore, which one makes things colder? Well, a hand warmer, that would be an exothermic reaction. A heating can would be an exothermic reaction. So therefore, the only one that would cool something down would be a sports injury pack. So therefore, that is your endothermic reaction. It then shows the reaction profile for an exothermic reaction. And what we'll do just before we look at the questions, we can label the different parts of it. So part B going from your reactants line to your products line is the energy needed to actually make the reaction happen. And we call that the activation energy. And then C, the difference in energy between your reactants and your products is the energy released. Now the lines from the bottom we never have a line from the bottom, so A and D actually are nothing. They're just there to confuse you. It then says which letter represents the activation for the reaction. So if we just labelled it, it was B. And which one represents the overall energy change? So that's the energy released, which we said was C. Question 1.4. Choose a, uh, the answer from the box. So in an exothermic reaction, the energy of the products is blank, the energy of the reactants. Well, we can look back at the exothermic reaction profile and we can see that the products are lower down because the energy has been given out from the chemicals. So you've just got to look at the diagram and you can identify it should be lower than. A student measured the temperature at the start and end of the reaction, named the apparatus, which just means equipment, used to measure the temperature. Don't overthink it, it's the beginning of the paper and it's one mark, it's just a thermometer. Question 1.6, figure 2 shows the temperature at the end of the reaction and it tells you in the table that the start temperature is 14.3. So if we read the scale carefully, it's at 25, so that'd be 26, 27, and it's halfway up at 27.5. You would then calculate the change in temperature, so you can use your calculator, 27.5 minus 14.3 gives you 13.1 degrees Celsius as your temperature change. Question two then. This question is about salts and electrolysis. A student wants to make copper chloride crystals. The student adds excess, which means loads, of copper oxide to some hot acid. The student stirs the mixture. Which acid should the student use? Well, you're making copper chloride crystals. So therefore, this is knowing what type of salts your different acids make. So it's all in the name. To make a chloride crystals, you would use hydrochloric acid. If you wanted, um, if you use nitric acid, you would make a nitrate salt. And if you use sulfuric, you would make a sulfate salt. Then, question 2.2. Suggest how the student would know that excess copper oxide had been added. Well, once you add excess, that means it stopped reacting and no more will react or dissolve. So there will be black copper oxide left over. Question 2.3 then. 
There are four more stages, A, B, C and D, to make copper chloride crystals, put them in the correct order. So what we've done so far, uh, we've mixed the acid and the copper oxide and we've got the, uh, we've added it to excess. Now this is the practical that you should remember, which is making the blue copper sulfate crystals you probably made at school. But this one is just copper chloride, but it's exactly the same method. So after you added loads of powder, what you would do, stage A, your first stage would be you filter it, okay? And then finally, after you've filtered it, you would then uh, partially evaporate the heating can with a water bath. So you get some of the water that you've made and get that heated and evaporated away. You would then leave it to crystallize for a little bit. And then stage D, you remove and uh, dry the crystals. So if you're going to put it into these orders, then it should just be B, A, C and D. Question 2.4. Molten copper chloride can be electrolysized. State the product at each electrode when molten copper chloride is electrolysized. So if you remember electrolysis, you have your electrolyte solution. And then you have two electrodes that are connected to a power supply. One is positive, one is negative. You then have your ions floating about in the solution. Now copper, because it's a metal, goes positive. And then chlorine, because it is a non-metal, gains an electron and it goes negative. So just remember, metals go positive, non-metals go negative. And when you would press the button and complete the circuit, they will be attracted to the opposite electrode. So the negative goes to the positive electrode, the chlorine goes to the positive, and the copper will be attracted to the negative because opposites attract. So therefore, at the negative electrode, you would get your copper, and at your positive electrode, you would get your chlorine. Question 2.5. A solution of copper chloride is electrolysized. Figure 3 shows the graph of the increase in mass of the negative electrode. So you're making copper on it, it's getting heavier. The increase is shown over a time of 10 minutes. You've been given the graph. It says calculate the gradient of the line in figure 3 using the following equation. So you need to work out the increase in mass and the increase in time and then divide them by each other. Okay, so you can see in this, your increase in mass is on your y-axis and you start at zero and you go up to four. So therefore, your increase in mass is four. Your increase in time, well, you start at zero and then you go up to 10 minutes. So therefore, your increase in time is 10 minutes. So therefore, the sum that you would do is quite simply 4 divided by 10, which gives you a reading of 0.4 milligrams per minute. OK, so that's just literally reading the graph and pulling the numbers off your axes. Question 2.6. Aluminium is produced by the electrolysis of a molten mixture. Complete the sentence. The molten mixture contains blank and aluminium blank. So this is one little case study of electrolysis that you should have looked at in class. And the ore that we get aluminium from is aluminium oxide. We need to remove the oxygen to give us the aluminium metal that we want and we can use to make things like tin cans and aeroplanes. Now we mix it with something called cryolite and the cryolite is just so it reduces the um, melting point of the mixture. That is very specific knowledge, but it's only worth one mark, so don't worry too much if you didn't get that point. Question three then. This question is about the periodic table and argon. 
In what order did scientists use to arrange for elements in the early periodic table? So remember, they didn't know about proton number in the early periodic table. They had to use something else. And the only thing that they could use was how heavy it was. They could only look at the atomic weight. They didn't know about neutrons, so they couldn't do that. They couldn't investigate the size of the atoms because they didn't have powerful um, detection equipment. And there's not really much point in, in sorting things in the year that they were discovered. So they based it just simply on their weight. In the modern, sorry, in early periodic tables, some elements were placed into the wrong groups. Mendeleev overcame some of these problems in his periodic table. Complete the sentence. Mendeleev did this by leaving blank for elements that had not been discovered. So hopefully you remember his big step forward was that he was smart enough to realise in the 1800s they didn't know all the elements, so he left gaps in his periodic table for elements that could be discovered. Question 3.3. .3. What is the name of the group that contains argon? So if you find argon in the periodic table that you'll have, you'll see it's under zero. Now there are three different groups you've got to know the names of. Alkali metals are group one. The halogens are what we call group seven. And it's the noble gases that we call group zero. So argon is in group zero, therefore it is a noble gas. The atom of argon is represented as 18 and 40 and the symbol AR. Determine the number of protons and the number of neutrons in one atom of argon. So the number of protons is our atomic number. So the bottom number tells us our number of protons. Now the top number is our mass number, which is the number of protons and neutrons together. So if our bottom number tells us we've got 18 protons and the top number tells us that together it's uh, protons and neutrons, there are 40 protons and neutrons, we can just take away the protons. So 40 minus 18 will leave us with 22 neutrons. Different atoms of argon are argon 18 and 18, that's consistent but you've got 39 and 38. So the mass numbers are different. What is the name given to these different atoms of argon? They are isotopes. Isotopes, if you don't remember, are atoms that have the same number of protons and electrons, but different numbers of neutrons. So their mass numbers change. A fullerene, that is a ball or a, or a sphere of carbon. An ion is when you have lost or gained electrons. And a molecule are when things are covalently bonded together. Question 3.6. What is the atomic structure of an argon atom? And it tells you the symbol there. Now remember, the bottom one tells it, yes, your number of protons, but in an atom, the number of protons also equals the number of electrons. So if I've got 18 electrons, think back to electron configurations, I've got two that go on my first shell, eight that would go on my next. So therefore I've used 10 electrons in total so far, and then I would have eight electrons that go on the outer shell to take me up to 18. So therefore my electron structure would be 288. Why is argon unreactive? Well, the noble gases, this is the key property you've got to know about the noble gases, that they're all unreactive because they have a full outer shell of electrons. Remember, kind of the aim of life for an atom is to get a full outer shell of electrons. Well, the group zero elements already have their full outer shell, so they don't need to do anything. 
they don't bother reacting because they've already got what they want. Question four then. This question is about the group one elements. Sodium reacts with chlorine to produce sodium chloride. Balance the equation for the reaction. So a bit of balancing equations where we can start off just by working out what we've got on each side. So we've got one sodium and two chlorines. On my left hand side, I've got one sodium, but only one chlorine on my right hand side. So remember, the only thing we can do when we balance equations is we put big numbers in front of the compounds. So I know I need another chlorine, so I'm going to have to put a two there. So I can then just change how many I've got. So now I've balanced and I've sorted my chlorines. Now, don't worry when you do balancing equations that if order, in order to sort one, you unbalance another, it's fine. It will just work itself out. So I've got my chlorine sorted, but now I've now got two sodiums. Now, I therefore need another sodium on my left hand side. So the easiest thing to do is just put a two there and now it is balanced. I've got two sodiums and two chlorines on each side. Question 4.2. 4.6 grams of sodium reacts with chlorine to produce 11.7 grams of sodium chloride. What mass of chlorine reacted? So this is taking you back to the experiment you should have done on conservation of mass. If I've got 4.6 grams of sodium and I'm making 11.7 grams of sodium chloride, Remember, your mass of your reactants, what you put in, has to equal your mass of your products. So what number can we add to 4.6 to make 11.7? Well, that number is uh, 7.1. So you can add 7.1. You could just subtract 4.6 from 11.7, and that gives you 7.1 grams. A teacher puts hot sodium into a gas jar of chlorine. The changes seen before, during and after the reaction are observed and complete the sentences using these different colours. So this is one specific practical that is normally done in a fume cupboard by a teacher. So not all teachers tend to do this. So if you haven't seen this practical, uh, go on YouTube, look, search for uh, sodium reacting with chlorine and then you can see what actually happens. Now sodium is a silver solid, it's a metal. It reacts with chlorine which is a greenish gas. The hot sodium burns with a yellow flame and the product of sodium chloride is a white solid. Okay, now you are also allowed to say that chlorine is a yellow gas. So if you put yellow, that is fine as well. And then sodium, you can also say it burns with a yellow or a white flame. So there are two potential answers for these two. Okay. Question 4.4. Sodium chloride is an ionic compound. Write the formulas of the ions in sodium chloride. Well, because you've got one sodium and you've got one chlorine, sodium's in group one, so it's Na+. Chlorine gains the electron from sodium and it becomes Cl-. So if you think what's happening in terms of electrons, okay, for sodium's one outer electron is given to the chlorine, Chlorine starts with seven electrons, but it gains the extra one from sodium. So therefore, sodium loses it and becomes positive. Chlorine gains it and becomes negative. So it's Na plus and Cl minus. Complete the sentence from the box. Potassium is more reactive than sodium. This is because potassium blanks more easily than sodium or potassium loses something more easily than sodium. You've got to remember, in a chemical reaction, the only things that move are your electrons. Everything else stays the same. 
So it's because potassium loses an electron more easily than sodium. How does the size of potassium compare with the size of sodium? Give a reason for your answer. Well, potassium, if you just look at the periodic table, it is a larger atom. So you could just say potassium is larger. And the reason, well, you can have a look at its numbers, it's got more electrons or protons or neutrons. You could also say um, it's got more shells. Question five then. This question is about oxygen and the compounds of oxygen. What is the state symbol for, of oxygen at room temperature? So your state symbols, there's only ever four of them. You've got solid, liquid, gas, and aqueous, AQ, which just means dissolved in a solution. Everyone should be quite comfortable with what solid, liquid, and gas is. The only one that is slightly different is aqueous. Oxygen, we should know, floating around us, it is a gas at room temperature, so the state symbol is just a G. Figure four shows the percentage by mass of the elements calcium, carbon, and oxygen in calcium carbonate. What is the percentage by mass of calcium in calcium carbonate? Well, we can see from the diagram, it's divided up, it's a little pie chart, and we've got 10 quadrants. We can see the ones relating to calcium relate to 4 out of the 10. So 4 out of 10 as a fraction, as a percentage, is just 40%. Question 5.3. At high temperature, sodium nitrate decomposes into sodium nitrate, nitrite and oxygen. A student heats three samples of sodium nitrate the mass of each sample was 4.5 grams. The mass of solid after heating each time was recorded. Table 2 shows the mass of solid after heating each experiment. Calculate the mean mass of solid after heating. So when you do the mean, it's the same as the average that you do in mass. Okay, You add them all together and then divide by how many there are. So in this one, I would do 3.76 plus 3.98 plus 4.09. Add that all together, which equals 11.83. I would then divide that by 3, and that gives you the answer of 3.943 recurring. Now this is said we want it to three significant figures. So three is your first significant figure, nine is your second, four is your third. So the number, next number is a three. Now, because it's lower than a five, you round down. So therefore, it just stays as 3.94 grams. Okay, so just add them up, divide how, by how many there are. Question 5.4. Table three shows the electronic structure of hydrogen and oxygen. So you've been given it there. Hydrogen only has one electron. Oxygen has two in its inner shell, then six on its next shell. Figure five shows part of the dot and cross diagram of water. You need to complete the dot and cross diagram. But we've only got to show the electrons in the outer energy shells. So we can see in this one, hydrogen, has put in one electron into the bond and so has oxygen. So we can do the same thing again. Now, oxygen is in group six, so it has six electrons. It's used two of the electrons in the bonds, but it would then have an extra four just to itself. So this is showing that each hydrogen is happy because it's got two electrons. And oxygen is now happy because it's now got eight outer electrons. So we call this a covalent or a simple covalent compound. So oxygen and sulfur are examples of simple molecules. Complete the sentences. There are 
blank bonds between the atoms of oxygen and um, uh, there are blank bonds between atoms of oxygen in an oxygen molecule where it's just covalent. Covalent is always between two non-metals. Ionic is always between a metal and a non-metal. And metallic is just happens when you've got a pure metal. Question 5.6. Figure 6 shows the relative sizes of an oxygen molecule and a sulphur molecule. How does the boiling point of sulphur compare to that of oxygen? The boiling point of sulphur, just using a bit of common sense here if you don't know it, it would be bigger or higher than the boiling point of oxygen. This is because in sulphur, the intermolecular forces would therefore be stronger than uh, the forces in oxygen. So remember, if you've got stronger forces, that gives a higher melting and boiling point. If you've got weaker forces, that would give a lower melting and boiling point. Question six. This Question is about the reaction of metals. Figure seven shows what happens when calcium, copper, magnesium, and zinc are added to hydrochloric acid. What is the order of decreasing reactivity of the four metals? So decreasing reactivity means starting with the most reactive, working your way down. So you can see calcium is the most, then magnesium, then zinc, then copper. So calcium is first, so it's the bottom one, calcium, magnesium, zinc, copper, just by looking at the picture. Then question 6.2. A student wants to make a fair comparison of the reactivity of the metals with hydrochloric acid. Name two variables that should be kept constant. Well, you are changing the, the, the type of metal so therefore everything else needs to stay the same. So you could have any of the following. So I'm just going to read them out instead of writing them down. You could have the mass or the amount of metal. You could have the surface area of the metal. Is it in a powder or is it um, as a lump? You could have the concentration of acid or the volume of acid or the type of acid. Or you could have the starting temperature of the acid. Question 6.3 then. What is the independent variable in the investigation? Well, we just said it. They are changing the type of metal. Question 6.4. Predict the reactivity of beryllium compared with magnesium. Give a reason for your answer. Well, we can see that beryllium is uh, higher on the react. Uh, sorry, is higher in group two than magnesium. It goes beryllium then magnesium. So you might remember when you saw the alkali metal demonstration that as you go down the group, it becomes more reactive. So as beryllium is above it, okay, it would be less reactive. So you could say, why is it less reactive? Well, you could say it's more difficult uh, to lose the electrons. To lose its electrons because it is more strongly attracted to the nucleus. Because it's smaller, it's closer together, the electron can be more strongly held on by the nucleus. Okay, so question 6.5 then. A solution of hydrochloric acid contains 3.2 grams of hydrogen chloride in 50 centimetre cubed. Calculate the concentration of hydrogen chloride in grams per decimeter. There's only one equation you need to remember in a foundation chemistry paper one, which is concentration is mass divided by volume. 
the mass in the question is 3.2 and your volume is 50 centimetre cubed. But our answer needs to be in decimetre cubed. We need to remember that one decimetre cubed is equal to a thousand centimetre cubed. So if I want to convert centimetres into the bigger unit of decimetres, I divide by a thousand. So what I would do is 50 divided by a thousand would give me 0 0.05 uh, decimetre cubed. So I've just converted 50 into decimetres. So it'd be 0 0.05, which is my volume. So 3.2 divided by 0 0.05 equals 64 grams per decimeter. So do watch out for unit conversions of centimeter cubed to decimeter cubed. Question seven. This question is about salts. Ammonium nitrate solution is produced when ammonia gas reacts with nitric acid. State the symbol give the state symbol for ammonium nitrate solution. Remember I said earlier, there are four state symbols, solid liquid gas, and the one for a solution, which is aqueous, AQ. What is the formula of nitric acid? So even if you don't know this, you can use a bit of process of elimination. So nitric would have nitrogen in it. So therefore, the only one that has, um, or actually there are two that have nitrogen in it, but we can use process of elimination and take that out, those two out. So it's between these two. Now, if you've got a OH, that means it is a hydroxide, which is an alkali, which is the opposite of an acid. So therefore, it must be the second one, HNO3. Just for reference, HCl, that's hydrochloric acid. NO3, HNO3 is nitric and H2SO4 is sulfuric acid. Ammonia gas dissolves in water to produce ammonia solution. Ammonia solution contains hydroxide ions, which are OH minus. A student adds universal indicator solutions um, to solutions of nitric acid and ammonia. What colour is observed in each solution? So this is just your knowledge of the pH scale. What happens to something or a solution of an acid if we add universal indicator? Well, it will go red. Remember, red is your acid colour, or you could say orange or yellow if it was a weaker acid. But in ammonia solution, which is an alkali, you could say it will go purple or blue. And they are your alkali colours. Question 7.4. A student gradually added nitric acid to ammonia solution. Which row, A, B, C or D, shows the change in pH as nitric acid is added to excess? So you're, imagine it, you're starting off with a beaker which has, um, which is uh, ammonia solution, so it's an alkali, and you're adding into it an acid. Hopefully you know the pH scale goes from 1 to 14. pH 1 is your acid, and pH 14 is your alkali. So, an alkali is always between 8 and 14, an acid is between 1 and 6, and 7 is neutral. So you're starting off with an alkali, so the number must be between 8 and 14, so therefore it tells us it can either be A or D, and as you're adding the acid to excess, that means you're adding loads of it. So therefore, if you're adding it to excess, it will go down to a greater value, because it would all be neutralised, and then go acidic, so it should be the bottom one. Question 7.5. Calculate the percentage by mass of oxygen in ammonium nitrate. So it gives you the formula of it here, and it's actually been kind and already calculated the relative formula mass for you. 
So you want to know how much oxygen is actually in this compound. So this is just a percentage. You know that ammonia solution NH4NO3 is equal to 80. But you want to know how much oxygen there is. Well, you've got three oxygen atoms. So what you can do is times your mass of oxygen by three. So 16, 32, 48. And then you just do it as a percentage. 48 over 80 times by 100 gives you 60%. Last question on this paper then. Describe a method to investigate how the temperature changes when different masses of ammonium nitrate are dissolved in water. You do not need to write about safety precautions. So this is a design practical question. You need to write an accurate method for it. You have been told that you are changing the different masses of ammonium nitrate. So that always start off by identifying your variables. What are you changing? The mass of ammonium nitrate. What are you measuring? What is your dependent variable? Well, you are measuring then the temperature. What should you then keep the same? Well, you would need, if you're changing the amount of ammonium nitrate and you're adding it into water, you should keep the same amount of water. You should also use the same concentration of ammonium nitrate. And if we're measuring temperature changes, we normally do it in a uh, polystyrene cup because it's a good insulator and therefore it makes it more accurate. So if we're going to now we've identified our variables, we can start think about what we're going to do. So point number one, you can set up any suitable container. So for example, you could get a beaker. You could then add insulation or use a polystyrene cup inside it. Okay, we would then add a set amount of water. Now it's your plan, so you can make up and put any amount of water that you want. So you could add 20 centimetre cubed of water. You would then think about what we're going to add to it. We're going to add, again, it's your plan so you can make up the values. Add maybe two grams of um, ammonium nitrate. You would then record the temperature change. You could also add at this stage, you would need to stir it to ensure that you get an even distribution of it. Okay, you can then do it again. So do this again with different math, uh, masses. And then a good thing to put at the end of all kind of design practical questions is repeat times three, you can calculate a mean and remove anomalies. Okay, and you can add that point to pretty much every design practical question. Okay, so that would be your rough method of how you would do it. That's the end of this paper. I um, hope it was useful. Remember, there's a blank copy of the paper, a link to it with the mark scheme in the description. If there's any um, uh, parts you need to revise, there's also question by question revision videos for you to go through and watch. And then you can try the question again. Hope it was useful. Thank you very much.